Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights in Entertainment. This is episode 95, Passing the Torch. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my dedicated and talented co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetheart? Doing okay. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Anything exciting going on this week? No. no nothing, huh? Or not this past week, I should say. True. This coming week is somebody's birthday, but, I you know. I have no idea what you're talking right. about. Yeah, not mine, but yeah. yours, so. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving anyway, on. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Somebody so. doesn't like birthdays. So today, <laughs> I, I don't like marking, hey, you survived another year, congratulations. Well, that's, you know what? In some cases, that that's a pretty good thing. Well, the sad thing is you don't measure it like that until you get to a certain age, and then True. you measure it like that, and that's right. the sad well, thing. Every year is important. Anyway, in today's Disney Detective, we'll be talking about uh, new membership options for Disneyland. Possibly. Possibly. We had touched on the uh, canceling of annual memberships, but they hadn't rolled out anything new yet, so we might have some follow-up on that. Then we have, in the wake of a new president, we have changes coming to the Hall of Presidents, uh, not without some controversy, so we'll talk about that. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Bo-Katan, uh, played by Katie Sackhoff, didn't know that Luke Skywalker was making a cameo in that last episode of Mandalorian until she saw it, mm -hmm. which was interesting. Mm-hmm. And then some additional information, some details on the next season of The Mandalorian and moving forward with it. Mm -hmm. And then some sad news in our entertainment news about the passing of a talk show legend. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. But before we get into that, I would like to encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get our audio versions Looking for insights into entertainment, video versions of all of our podcasts are available under Insights into Things. We are listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Google. I said Google already, right? Yes, you did. You messed me up because it's not a linear list now. Overcast. Yeah, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Castro. Uh, I'll, pretty much any place you can get a podcast for listening <laughs> at this point. I need if to there's a podcast down. app, we're there somewhere. We, we also want to invite folks to send us some feedback. Tell us how we're doing, what you'd like us to talk about. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Or you can reach out to us through our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Sure. Right. Go for Disney Detective. So in the wake of canceling the annual pass holder program, Ken Potrock, who is the president of Disneyland, actually spoke to the Orange County Register about the resort's future membership options. Now, he really didn't come out and say much, you know, that was very specific. Um, basically, he, you know, kind of went the uh, generic way of, of talking about things. 
basically saying that um, the Disneyland Resort team will be using the time while Disneyland and Calif- Disney's California Adventure remain closed to develop new offerings and a new way to think about the business given the situation we find ourselves in. Um, he listed, you know, the following questions that basically they're considering in what type of membership to the membership options. You know, he said, you know, what do people want in this new world? When do they want to access our parks? How frequently do they want to access? Uh, with what level of spontaneity? Uh, with what level of value? All, you know, these kind of things and more. So obviously, you know, they're going to probably try to incorporate some ele- elements of the old annual pass holder program, but I guess they've been hinting at um, some new features and some new flexibility. So he said it's not designed to limit choices and flexibility. It's designed to enhance choice and flexibility. People may say uh, here how I've, you know, this is how I've always used it or uh, you know, when I bought it, I didn't really quite use it as much or optimize it, or now I have a different family structure, or my financial situation is now different. Um, you know, is it something where I only use it midweek, or I only use it on the weekends, or I go more in the morning or more in the afternoon? Um, you know, so they're basically kind of taking everything into account to try and come up with the best way, um, you know, going forward. Uh, what was interesting was there was a different article, uh, that came out this week, um, talking about just annual pass holders in general, how really Disney doesn't make any money, you know, or as much money off of them as, a regular guest that just goes down, you know, for, for a week or or so. And we had talked about that too. Um, and the other thing too, was there was one article that talked about, um, so while Disneyland isn't doing park passes, obviously, or annual passes at this point in time, that in Orlando for Florida, you can still renew your annual pass, but there was something that I saw that said that they weren't issuing anything new for annual passes at this time. So I don't know if that's, you know, again, that was really the first time that I ever saw anything that mentioned that they weren't doing new annual passes, that they were just doing renewals at this point in time. So it'll kind of be interesting to see what they come up with because we know in Florida from, you know, from our, um, you know, uh, experience, they have so many different versions of the annual pass. There isn't just one annual pass. There's multiple types of annual passes. So I could totally see them doing that for California as well. Cause I don't know how many passes types of passes they had had, before, but you could definitely see them, you know, coming out with, you know, 10 different versions of it, which I'm sure would be very confusing for anybody deciding to purchase one. Like, okay, which one, which one do we want this, this year? Um, so it'll be, you know, interesting to see as more information, you know, comes out about it. Yeah. There's two takeaways that I have for this. One's, you know, the positive that they're definitely looking at additional options. Mm Mm-hmm. And they appear at least to be very open-minded on the surface as to what they want to offer because they want to customize things for people. The negative that I get from this is they don't, like all of us, they don't know what normal is going to be. Right. You know, at this point in time, they're still trying to wrap their heads around Mm -hmm. what it's going to be like, you know, maybe when these vaccines get out and, you know, the estimate right now is we might have enough vaccinations out by the fall Mm -hmm. to start kind of returning back to normal a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I think everybody agrees normal is not going to be normal Mm -mm. like we knew it anymore. Right. So good thing that they're, they're trying to be Mm -hmm. flexible. Uh, Right. Bad thing that they're as clueless as the rest of us are at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Hall of Presidents. So shortly after Joe Biden's inauguration on Wednesday, 
Walt Disney World closed its Hall of Presidents attraction at Magic Kingdom to make room for the new audio animatronic of the 46th president. Just as quickly, Disney fans began to share their opinion on how they think the Orlando, Florida theme park should handle the change and specifically the controversial Donald Trump audio animatronic, which was added just in 2017. Um, While some suggested hiding Trump behind previous presidents, others asked Disney to just remove him entirely now that he's no longer in office. So there have been talk among fans who feel uh, Disney World should actually just remove the attraction entirely. Disney World closed uh, the Hall of Presidents attraction for refurbishment immediately after his inauguration. Um, there happened to be a uh, journalist, Ashley Carter, who had shared on Twitter that the theme park had placed the small sign outside of the attraction on Wednesday that reads, Hall of Presidents is currently being prepared to welcome the new president. Now, it's currently unclear how long it will take Disney to create and install the audio animatronic inspired by Biden. But that being said, Disney fans have pointed out that the theme park was much quicker to install the figure of the 46th president than they were when they were installing Trump uh, years prior. It actually took them 11 months to install Trump's audio animatronic, which honestly (laughs) looks nothing like him uh we never went to hall of presidents while um he was the the main president um and from videos that we saw it looked absolutely nothing like him a lot of people thought it looked like a really bad version of uh, trump as mrs doubtfire with a mix of hillary clinton kind of put in And, you know, just kind of, you know, it was almost Disney's way of kind of poking fun at, really, because any other president that has been, you know, in power and been the spotlight of it has always looked and acted and sounded like, you know, that current president. Um, So, obviously, Hall of Presidents, if you're not familiar, it features all audio animatronics of all the past presidents, but only those represent uh, representing Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, and the incumbent president of the United States actually give a speech during the stage show. Um, and as a result, all the other audio animatronics just kind of take a, a back seat, but they everybody kind of gets a moment of the spotlight because they do announce each president, you know, in order. And, and some of them move a little bit and some of them move a little bit um more uh so of course again disney fans um you know have have come forward saying that they would really prefer that the past president be a little bit more hidden or in the wake of everything that happened prior to uh the uh the inauguration that he actually be completely removed um, as well. But then again, there are fans that are saying, you know what, this is such a old attraction and that really it shouldn't even be there anymore, that it's not part of, you know, Walt's original plan, you know, for things, Um, you know, so there's, there's lots of talk pro and con on, you know, on everything for this. Yeah, and I think it's unfortunate that people are are trying to use their dislike of Donald Trump. Granted, you know, there is a lot to dislike about him, mm-hmm. especially in this last year of his presidency. But the fact that people are trying to use that as an impetus to change a ride that that is educational mm-hmm. and entertaining Absolutely. and a lot of people enjoy mm-hmm. is unfortunate. I think People need to realize, you know, there are popular presidents, there are unpopular presidents. And when you get an unpopular president, he's, whether people feel it or not, he's entitled to the same level of treatment as a popular president Mm -hmm. is when it comes to this attraction. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not a president anymore. He's going to take a back seat. Right. Stick him over in the background next to Andrew Jackson and be done with it. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's what you do. Maybe that's what they need to do is start kind of moving the not so popular, right. you know, presidents. Well, because and- a lot of people point out, oh, well, you know, there's there's presidents there that were slave owners that shouldn't be there. Well, guess what? George Washington was a slave mm-hmm. owner. Right. So if you're going to get rid of presidents that based on today's standards right. from 100, 200 years ago, right. you can't rewrite history. Right. You, you can't because it's judged by a different standard. Mm-hmm. Right. You have to learn from it and adapt and be better. Exactly. So put put them in the background. Let's move on. Keep the ride, you know, the attraction mm-hmm. open. Let's yeah. put the new president in. And let's just keep that cycle going. Yeah. I, I can definitely see that it's going to be much sooner than, you know. Well, and since... <laughs> Since Trump made such a big deal about having Andrew Jackson as the background of the Oval Office, let's make Trump the background of Andrew Jackson at this mm-hmm. point in time. Yeah, yeah. And, and keep, you know, birds of a feather together there. Works for me. So that was all we had for Disney Detective. Mm-hmm. We'll be back in a minute with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. <laughs> For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge <laughs> of the Galaxy. So the Mandalorian sophomore season was chock full of surprises and specifically in the form of Luke Skywalker. While just about everybody and their grandmother now knows about the iconic Jedi's appearance in the Disney Plus show, it was actually revealed that this, it was kept a secret for an, an entire calendar year. And now it appears that not just the fans were in the dark about it, but that also some of the actors that were directly involved in the big finale didn't know it was him as well. So Bo-Katan actress Katie Sackhoff had revealed that she didn't know the identity of the Jedi that would appear in the Mandalorian season finale until the episode actually aired on Disney+. Plus. She said, I didn't know until I saw it with you guys. I just didn't know. They didn't tell us who it was. There was an actor there with dots on his face. She says, I, I'm, she says, I kind of put it together, but at the t- same time, I thought to myself, they would they would have let us know, right? She continued that um, they told them that it was a Jedi, but never said that it was actually Luke. So, you know, they said, all right, well, you know, maybe they know, but we didn't know. And it was a Jedi because you saw the X-Wing and then you kind of start putting things together. But again, until she saw the episode like everybody else, she didn't know. And, you know, the funny thing is that obviously we know Star Wars likes to keep people in suspense they like to you know keep things a secret um you know and going back to 1980 when empire strikes back hit the theaters the massive no i am your father twist came as a shock not only to fans but also cast members because uh mark hamill had actually mentioned and he's talked about it since that the original line was Obi-Wan killed your father and that they actually changed it in post-production so that this way nobody knew about it until the movie, you know, came out and all of the the actors that were, you know, part of it as well didn't know about it. 
So to kind of, you know, see that they're still kind of keeping this going, you know, is a, a nice little treat. And obviously we've known that there have been all these little uh, things that people didn't know about Baby Yoda being, you know, one of the other examples that until we saw the episode, we didn't know that character was going to be there. And, you know, and then the whole line of merchandise, obviously, was hurt in in some respects because of this delay. So kind of cool that, again, you know, it was a, a secret that was well kept. And, you know, because of the magic of CGI, they were able to, you know, pull off something, you know, really cool in the season finale. Yeah, it's pretty neat that they're kind of keeping to this uh, tradition of mm-hmm. holding that little bit back so you don't get everything. Right, right. What's amazing is that they're able to do it today. Mm-hmm. Like, right. Back in, in, you know, 1979 when they were filming Empire Strikes Back, you didn't have the internet and social media. Right. And everybody with phones, with cameras on set. Right. You know, when they were when they were doing the filming for uh, The Last Jedi, mm-hmm. there were they were filming on the on the uh, island Act Two off of the coast of uh, Ireland, mm-hmm. and Skellig Michael was the name of the island. And uh, when they would t- get on the boat to get there, because you couldn't, they didn't have facilities to actually stay on the on the island okay. itself. In the morning, you'd get on the boat and you'd, you'd get a, an ID tag. Mm-hmm. And the ID tag didn't have anybody's name on it. Everyone was given like a number. Okay. So you knew what your number was, but anybody who it. looked at the board to take their number didn't know who, who else was anybody on the else set was there. or anything like okay. that. So it's like that level of wow. secrecy yeah. that they had. And you have to with this, you know, considering oh, yeah. how many people, because they've got everyone and their brother coming in for cameos mm-hmm. and everything on the show now. Right, right. Which I think is kind of interesting on the part of John Favreau, mm-hmm. where he's he's trying to include all these other fans of the right. show, mm-hmm. yeah, and bring them in. <clears throat> um, like you know, last season when they brought in the five hundred first to to fill in to when fill they needed more stormtroopers, right, right, yeah. So you've got that kind of exposure. You're you're not filming in these remote locations, right. So you're filming in a populated area. So it's really hard to keep this information under wraps. Right. But it's it's kind of neat that they're doing that even for the for the actors that are participating. Right. Because, well. you know, the article talked about, you know, how for Empire Strikes Back, you know, like Harrison Ford didn't know about it. But he wasn't part of the scene. He wasn't on s- that area when it was going on. Whereas... Katie was there. She was, right. you know, right, you know, well, 20 feet from him and had no with, idea. With Empire Strikes Back, the only person on the scene other than the director at the time that knew right. was Mark Hamill. David Prowse, who mm-hmm. was voicing the original lines, because all his lines were dubbed over right, anyway. Right, right. He didn't even know. Right. So when Luke had that emotional outburst. Right. They all thought it was genuine because it was, you know, Obi-Wan killed your father. And, right. You know, it wasn't until afterwards that they found out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so very, very cool. hmm So we have some additional Mandalorian news. What else do we have? Yeah, so it seems, you know, obviously we're all counting down the, the number of unknown number of days until season three debuts. Um, but it seems that Pedro Pascal had actually, you know, dropped, you know, a little bit of information. He was actually speaking with IndieWire, and he confirmed that there will be a timeline jump in some capacity that will happen in uh, episode or season three. He said, I am told what happened, what's happening and what the plan is, but I can't share it. Uh, They are in the expansion of this world, uh, and there are so many unexpected surprises and timelines that are going to be dealt with. Um, He said, if the character were to cross over into these worlds, it'll be utilized in a way that isn't meant to be expected. I wouldn't want to spoil the surprise of whether or not characters from the show we already know are crossing over. So kind of a teaser as to everything, but again, not really a whole lot is known. We do know that, you know, they're 
basically going to be having this whole Mandalorian saga, which is going to include the spinoffs of Ahsoka and the Rangers of the New Republic, which are all kind of going to coincide, you know, run together with season three. And it'll introduce the animated series Star Wars Rebels World Between Worlds in the live action for the first time. So, you know, it'll be interesting to kind of see how everything kind of intertwines, you know, and and comes together. Obviously, you know a little bit more of that because you've, you know, seen all the different animated series and and uh, whatnot. So you could probably talk a little bit more about where you possibly think it could go. Well, and that's the thing. The the one advantage you have with a time jump here is you've got so many projects they're juggling right now right. that those projects can be used to fill in those time gaps. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the problem that we've had so far with the, the sequel trilogy that came out was you had this huge 30-year time jump. Mm-hmm. Right. And there wasn't anything to fill in the gap. So now you got Mandalorian and it's five years after mm-hmm. Jedi now. So they're going to jump another however many years. Right. couple years maybe. You've got – Two or three more series are coming out <coughs> mm-hmm. that are going to fill in those gaps in there. So you're start going to start getting a cohesive picture moving forward from Return of the Jedi, which is very nice to, to hear them laying it out like this. Mm-hmm. And then you have the fact that we talked last week about them bringing Heir to the Empire into the right. canon. Mm-hmm. So all of this is very much likely leading into all of that. That that Thrawn trilogy that mm-hmm. we're going to see at that point in time because they're all little bits and pieces that you're going to add together to to fuel that epic adventure mm-hmm. that starts with Heir to the Empire. So it's a very, very good outlook there. I was concerned when they announced all the shows that were coming mm-hmm. out because they didn't give any detail. Right. Now with a, a time jump here and this piece fitting here and this other piece maybe fitting in here to explain some stuff – all these shows now make sense. There's right. a place for them now with this right. time jump. There's this whole, you know, timeline that was kind of laid out showing this is this, this is this, and, right. you know. and See, if you didn't do that time jump, then you're jumbling everything mm-hmm. in together and, and you're going to start having genres and characters and storylines that are stepping on each mm-hmm. other. You know, I could see them doing a five-year, maybe a, even a ten-year jump. Right. And then everything else filling in those blanks there. Like I could see, you know, Mandalorian end it with the quest to go back. You know, he's he's taken up the dark saber. Right. He's taken up the mantle to retake the planet Mandalore. Mm-hmm. Now I could totally see the time jump happening after that struggle. Right. Where he's there or someone else is there, and now we're we're moving on to the next phase. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so it looks good. I mean, right now they're they're laying stuff out in a very organized manner mm-hmm. to, to get to a larger. Right. Because, picture. again, you were very concerned hearing all of these different things that were going to be coming out where you kind of felt they were saturating. Absolutely. Everything. But again, like you said, because they're spacing things out and, you know, it, it's, I think, going to paint, like you said, paint that picture where the the fan that only watches the movies right you know doesn't understand what happened in that 30 year time frame between return of the jedi and the force awakens like how did we go back to evilness right. and, and you the, know. the problem is, is they <clears throat> tried to do that but they tried to lay it out in the novels and mm-hmm. the video games right and the average fan's not going to consume right. that. So unless you're right. a diehard fan, you're not going to get the whole picture. Exactly. That's why the, the television outlet or the streaming outlet mm-hmm. here is perfect for this because the casual fan will pick that up mm-hmm. now. Right. And you'll get that. And you can delve into the, the minutia and the details and some of the character development in the novels if you want to. But you don't want the plot hooks to be in there. Right. You want the plot hooks to be out there so that everybody can see it and you can see that progression. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like that's the direction they're going. And and as long as, you know, Favreau and Filoni are involved there, you've got my vote of approval. Absolutely. So that was all we had for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be back with our entertainment news in a minute. Mm-hmm. Insights into teens. 
Lens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Um, so we had some sad news that that came out uh, yesterday morning. Uh, Larry King, the self-made man from Brooklyn who spent six decades proudly winging it as an interviewer on the radio and as host of his own uh, nightly talk show on CNN, had passed away. Um, he was 87 years old. Uh, he died Saturday morning at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, according to a statement that was posted to his official social media accounts. Um, the cause of death has not been specified, but he had been hospitalized with COVID uh, earlier this month. Um, CNN went live with the news shortly after 8 a.m. Um, with the network anchor uh, reading a statement from the uh, CNN president, Jeff Zucker, um, and noted how King had helped to put CNN on the map and was a force on cable and a force on television. Uh, the statement had read, We mourn the passing of our colleague Larry King. The scrappy young man from Brooklyn had a history-making career spanning radio and television. His curiosity about the world propelled his award-winning career in broadcasting, but it was his generosity of spirit that drew the world to him. We are so proud of the 25 years he spent with CNN, where his newsmaker interviews truly put the network on the international stage. From our CNN family to Larry's, we send our thoughts and prayers and a promise to carry on his curiosity for the world in our work. Um, he, you know, what was kind of interesting was that he never went to college. He never took a journalism class. He first made his mark in Miami um, and then to a studio in Washington, D.C., where he hosted the first national talk show um, in the U.S. and attracted a weekly audience of three to five million listeners. Uh, he then went on to host the Larry King Live on CNN from June of 19. 19- uh, 85 until December of 2010. Um, and he earned a listing in the Guinness Bur Book of Records as having the longest running show with the same host in the same time slot. Um, on CNN's fifth anniversary, King went on the air as host of the Larry King Live. He said, I knew 10 minutes into that show that it was going to work. Um, and his first guest was then New York Governor Mario Cuomo. Um, he gave up the radio gig in 1994 and then three years later moved to L.A. Um, and he, in the late 90s, the Larry King Live regularly reached more than 1.5 million viewers a night. Um, you know, he, he went on to say that, you know, many criticized him for being um, too soft with guests. And he said, I'm basically who, what, where and when and why. Um, he said that I try to ask questions that only take a minute or two, that only take two or one, one or two sentences to answer. If it takes three sentences, it was a bad question. He goes, I don't show off. I, you know, I don't use the word I when I do an interview. You know, he always said, I was wondering, or let me ask you this. Um, and he would never go on air with the idea of embarrassing a guest or building up, you know, he said, I was always there to learn, you know, from the guest. Um, 
He's obviously interviewed tens of thousands of people from, you know, President Nixon to Vladimir Putin to Tammy Faye Baker, um, you know, to Paris Hilton. You know, he's basically, you know, done it all, Um, you know, and he also took calls from viewers and and listeners as well. Um, He had recovered from a heart attack in 1987 he was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day but he went back on television and had lost some weight and you know because he had lost so much weight his wife had suggested that he wear suspenders and that became his trademark look um back then um obviously not only being on cnn and doing interviews he obviously showed up many times in you know television shows and films he was on murphy brown uh, american crime story he was in films such as dave uh the long kiss goodbye and obviously kids would recognize his voice as doris from three of the shrek movies yeah he uh to say he was a class act, I think, doesn't mm-hmm. even do him credit. He yeah. was. Yeah. He was an iconic interviewer. Mm-hmm. He knew how to talk to people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he knew, you know, the one of the toughest things when you interview people is to to put them at ease and to get them to relax and to feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Because uh, unfortunately, a lot of show hosts out there today are going for that shock factor. They're right. trying to get a rise out of their guests. They're mm-hmm. trying to get some kind of emotional outburst or emotional setting out of them and it puts a lot of interviewees on Mm -hmm. the defensive when that happens right he would ask simple things that the average person would want to know about these people Mm -hmm. and he had such a you know distinctive voice that instantly recognizable Mm -hmm. and and his like even his sets went went to the cast to that make you feel comfortable they were such simple right you know non-flamboyant sets that you Mm -hmm. would sit there and and you know you'd watch these interviews and it was a one-on-one like Mm -hmm. these two people just happen to have a conversation together right and and the fact that he didn't go to journalism school or college or anything for that that's natural talent right and and you rarely see that today without it being coached heavily Mm -hmm. in people yeah so it's unfortunate. When I saw that he did have COVID, given his advanced age, I was not hopeful right. at, at what the outcome was going to be. But yeah, he was he was a legend. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, we were all fortunate to to have him and to have his legacy. Mm-hmm. So that was all we had for entertainment news. Mm-hmm. We'll be back momentarily with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick was one that you actually had done a couple weeks back. Um, so now it was my turn to to give a review of it. Um, and it is the Amazon original, uh, The Boys. Um, when you had reviewed it, we were in the middle of season one. And now we have finally um, made it through season two. <laughs> And fortunately, our heads did not explode. Um, <laughs> so um, so it, it talks about how, you know, superheroes are often as popular as celebrities, as influential as politicians, and sometimes even as revered as gods. But that's when they're using their powers for good. What happens when the heroes go rogue and start abusing their powers when it's uh, when it's the powerless against the powerful, pa- uh, super powerful, the boys heads out on a heroic quest to expose the truth about the seven and Vought, uh, the million dollar conglomerate that manages the superheroes and covers up their dirty secrets. Uh, the show is actually based on the comic book series of the same name. Um, this was one again that, People at work had kind of talked about it. Um, we were kind of hesitant at first to to start watching it. And then um, it's one of those you kind of have to go in and go, this isn't Marvel. This isn't DC. This is something kind of completely different. And once you get over the first couple of episodes of season one, you kind of realize, okay, this is something different. Um, they're not afraid to kill off somebody in a quick second 
Um, what it you know, so if you can get past the goriness of some of the scenes and you know take in the story it's just interesting to to see a different take on things it kind of almost reminded me of i i can't remember what um what network the show was on and i don't think it it made it past its first season but they had come out you know because again all these marvel movies coming out and all these dc movies coming out and there was this uh sitcom that came out basically you know what happens in this world of superheroes like who's doing all the cleanup you know when they come in and fight some supervillain, and you have all these buildings that are uh you know destroyed and all these cars that are overturned and you know basically it was the idea behind it was kind of what happens when the cleaning crew has to come in and, and take care of things but it was done as a comedy where seeing this it's almost that that same you know, aspect of that behind the scenes aspect of it, but much darker, realizing that, you know, na- now you you realize in, in season two, you know, a lot more darkness th- that came out, a lot more secrets that came out. And again, the cliffhanger for, for season two was, oh, Okay, where are they going? You know, not everything is as it seems. Not everybody is on the team that you think they're on. Um, so very well done. Uh, the one thing that we need to kind of go back and, and watch now is they kind of had a um, after show show, kind of like Talking Dead, um, you know, was, was the Walking Dead's um, companion. They had one for uh the boys as well and we watched a couple of episodes of the first season but for the second season they were doing one show i think every week as the the new shows were coming out so that'll be interesting to kind of go back and watch that to see if there's anything that we missed uh or that we didn't see but again really good show you know if you're into the whole superhero genre and You know, definitely not for little kids to watch because obviously there's language and there's very graphic scenes of various different (laughs) kinds. But overall, just a a really good show. And we definitely became, you know, fans of it. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is a little bit different. It's not a documentary or movie or TV show. It's actually a novel. Uh, It's the third, actually, in a series of novels. So everyone knows that I'm a Star Wars fan, but there's another sci-fi genre that I'm a big fan of. Really? The Halo universe. Uh, Halo being the video game that was originally put out uh, by Bungie for uh, the Xbox. There's an entire storyline, a series of books for it, and continuing story for it. Uh, There's a recent trilogy of books, the last of which in that trilogy by Troy Denning, is Halo Shadows of Reach, uh, October 2559. It's been a year since the Red Engade artificial intelligence Cortana issued a galaxy-wide ultimatum subjecting many worlds to martial law under the indomitable grip of her forerunner weapons. Outside her view, the members of Blue Team, John 117, the Master Chief, Fred 104, Kelly 087 and Linda 058 are assigned from the UNSC Infinity to make con- to make a covert insertion onto the ravaged planet Reach, their former home and training ground, and the site of humanity's most cataclysmic military defeat near the end of the Covenant War. Reach still hides myriad secrets after all these years. Lutine's mission is to penetrate the rubble-filled depths of Castle Base and recover top-secret assets locked away in Dr. Catherine Halsey's abandoned laboratory. Assets which may prove to be humanity's last hope against Cortana. But Reach has been invaded by a powerful and ruthless alien faction who have their own reasons for being there. Establishing themselves as a vicious occupying force on the devastated planet this enemy will soon transform Blue Team's simple retrieval operation into a full-blown crisis. 
And with the fate of the galaxy hanging in the balance, mission failure is not an option. So the book itself is the third in the series. It sort of builds to this crescendo. It's all centered around uh, John 117, the Master Chief from the video games themselves. And uh, Troy Denning does the he's a he's a fantastic writer. He's one of my one of my favorite writers in the genre. And and he has this this technique of layering complexity on top of the story as you go along. So every time you you turn a corner and you think you're going to sum up what this storyline is, something else gets added to it. And it complements everything that's come before it. Uh, so it's an excellent read. The whole series is an excellent read. I didn't review the other books because uh, I had read them quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I may wind up reviewing those on, on the podcast moving forward. But Halo Shadows of Reach by Troy Denning, available now. And we'll be right back. So I think that's all we had today. Mm -hmm. uh, did we have any closing thoughts? Um, did we, the one thing I did want to ask you about was what were your thoughts on the events surrounding the inauguration since we had such a celebrity parade that came out? What, what do you think about that? I think it was very refreshing, um, very unifying. Um, and you know, the other thing too was it was so different just that one day than the past four years have been. Obviously, we're not shy. We're not, you know, um, we're very transparent when it comes to how we felt politically uh, sure, about. Sure. And you I know. don't want to villainize Trump in this. I'm just curious oh, what your thoughts were with the. But just. You know, it, it was nice to finally see the country come together, you know, and and again, it was a varied group of, of celebrities. And the other thing, too, is even at the inauguration, you know, you had Lady Gaga, who obviously very much a, a supporter of, of Biden and was very outspoken about it. And then you had Garth Brooks, who is a registered Republican, and he was even there. So it was just interesting to see no matter, you know, no matter your party lines, everybody was there for the unified vision of, you know, the future and just very, very positive, you know, outlook on on everything. Very emotional. It was, uh, you know, the inauguration was uh you know very well done and then they had a little celebration of uh, america that that came on um that night afterwards and not only you know was it um you know different celebrities singing and and uh you know showing up to talk about things but they also highlighted various you know americans who have been making a difference since covid has hit you know you had the ups driver and you had um you know, children starting, you know, donation foundations to to help others and and the nurses, um, you know, that are, are helping to fight. And it was it was a beautiful celebration to to see. Yeah, I agree. I, I think they sort of touched on all the points that needed to be touched on. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a I think the administration in general is going to be clearly a very different style of mm -hmm. administration in the past. And I think. To start that new administration off, you kind of needed this outreach, this bringing together, mm -hmm. you know, this crossing the aisle. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you talked about Garth Brooks being a registered Republican. I, and I think that show of solidarity is important that it, it doesn't matter what your party is. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, we need to do what's right for the country. Right. We're all Americans. We are all you know, citizens of the United States Absolutely. of America. Absolutely. So I think it was, I think it was very well done. It mm -hmm. was, it was certainly entertaining mm -hmm. and it was probably the most patriotic thing that I think I've seen the, our government put out and yes, in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Sure. I didn't, didn't want to skip out on that. No problem. Before we do go, I would encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast. Our audio versions of the podcast can be found as Insights into Entertainment. The video versions of the podcast and all of our shows can be found as Insights into Things. 
We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, uh, and everything else. I'm not going to go down the whole list. <laughs> it's kind of redundant. <laughs> Uh, we do encourage folks to reach out to us, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We are on Twitch, usually six days a week, streaming at twitch.tv slash insights into things. We are on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, you can find us at insights into things. Uh, the audio versions of all of our podcasts can be found at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And you can get high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And if you missed any of those links and just want to go to our main website, that would be insightsintothings.com. All right. I think that is it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.